Good day. Good day, everyone. I'm Sheila Harris, the immediate past president of LAI International, and I'm here today to welcome you to our first in our series on housing affordability. We've put together a great panel, and today we're going to focus on the missing middle. And in a bit, I'll turn this over to Carol Gallant, who will introduce the panel, as well as a little bit more about the topic. We do want to hear from you, and please send us comments in the chat or to Sheila Hamilton directly on other topics that you would like to see in this series. This is becoming a topic that some of us have been working on for a long time, and others are just new to this arena. But we want to make sure that we are covering all our bases and we have a common language in which we can talk and move forward in creating solutions. We're happy today to have representatives from both Canada and the United States on our panel. And as you can see on your screen now, we have a land economics weekend coming up later this year in Barcelona, and we hope you can join us there as well. As I said, this is the first in our series. We're very interested in hearing from you. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Carol Gallant, who's going to introduce our panelists. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, where whatever time zone uh, you are on. It's uh, great to um, see the participants popping in at the bottom of the uh, screen here. So um, I would just want to introduce uh, this panel, which uh, is focused on housing affordability, and I would say in a uh, type in the type of housing that we produce and how we can create more housing affordability uh, writ large, not necessarily all deed restricted, very low income, but you know, adding more supply in creative ways in um, uh, infill locations uh, to really increase the supply of housing uh, to create more housing affordability uh, overall. And we have a great group of panelists here today. Um, and we're going to, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to uh, uh, introduce each person uh, as they uh, kick off uh, their presentation. So each of our panelists will give uh, a, a very short uh, seven to 10 minute uh, presentation. Uh, and then we'll get into a conversation uh, amongst us. And uh, there, you can put questions in the chat and we will answer them as we go along. And if we don't get to them, uh, we will also reserve time at the end of this panel to um, you know, pick up and answer questions that we haven't been able to focus on during the uh, conversation. So I look forward to uh, diving in with all of you. And we're gonna start with uh, the person who really coined the term uh, missing middle housing, uh, who has a, a deep background uh, in, uh, in this. And uh, he is going to help level set all of us uh, in the terminology and history of uh, missing middle housing. So that is uh, Dan uh, uh, Perolik. And he actually is the person who wrote the book on missing middle. So Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Carol. Uh, it's great to be here today. I'm always obviously very, a topic that I'm very passionate about. So I'm Dan Perolik. I'm the founding principal of Opticoast Design. And um, uh, just was asked to give a short presentation to give a little bit of a foundation to the discussion today about missing middle housing. And um, uh, I like this title of thinking big and building small to respond to today's housing crisis. And that was actually the title of my book as well. Um, and I think that, you know, I created this concept about 10 plus years ago now to, as we were doing our planning work, our zoning work and work with developers to help reframe the conversation about housing in the communities that we were working in, because we found that there's a lot of really loaded terminology that we often use in our planning processes and our communication with communities that is really ineffective. And just as an example, this great little courtyard typology that we found on a a walking tour of, of Midtown Sacramento is a type of the form and scale and character that people really like and it resonates with them. But when you actually tell them, um, uh, they're, they're quite surprised to realize that this building actually generates a density of 90 units per acre. 
And um, if you were to come into a neighborhood and say, we're going to allow 90 units per acre in your neighborhood, people would obviously get up in arms. It would be hard to build support for it. But if you start with a conversation about appropriate form and scale and typology, we just found it's a, a much more effective way to, to build support for this idea of the delivery of more housing choices and more attainable housing options. And for us, um, we have defined a missing middle housing as house scale buildings with multiple units and ideally in walkable neighborhoods. And back to this idea of housing types, it's the duplex, the triplex, fourplex, cottage courts that exist in almost every neighborhood built prior to the 1940s that we just stopped building um, many decades ago that we really need in, in every community across the country. And this this notion of the house scale have we found is to be really, really important in terms of communicating with community members and building support, as well as building support from decision makers and ultimately informing um, how your zoning is changed to deliver these house scale missing middle building types. Just a really great example here of a, a triplex that looks and feels and behaves much like a single family home, but actually integrates three units uh, within it. And, um, how does missing middle uh, fit into the this discussion, this broader discussion about affordability and, and the way that we frame this is with this barbell where uh, there's efforts needed to, to increase the supply of housing on one end of the barbell. And then on the other end of the bar barbell, it's obviously an important part of the, the toolkit to be thinking about subsidized capital A affordable housing, but the missing middle fits, uh, as we define it, fits right into the middle of this. And with the right zoning, with thoughtful design, we found that it can deliver what we call affordable by design or attainably priced housing. And that price point will vary obviously market to market, but what we've found is like the 70 to 80% of median income and above is typically where um, the missing middle can effectively deliver uh, those housing choices. Um, before I dive into some of our public sector applications as well as our developer private sector applications, I wanna talk about some of our shared techniques and tools that sort of are applied to this broad spectrum of project types. And we recently created this um, missing middle sweet spot Dan, diagram. Dan, yes. Dan, is, uh, if you're sharing your screen, I can't see it. Oh, sorry. I was sharing my screen. I thought I was. Thank you. Sorry about that. Is that up now? Yes. Sorry about that. So um, I apologize, but let me just, uh, I think a lot of people have probably seen this diagram, but um, this idea of that the house scale um, with multiple units um, is a really key part of this. Uh, then with this triplex example of reinforcing a house scale building with multiple units, um, and then the barbell diagram sort of showing the role of missing middle sort of right at the heart of uh, an affordable housing toolbox and its ability to deliver uh, affordability by design. And um, this missing middle sweet spot diagram uh, is something that we created recently that was informed by our work and we felt that was necessary to help uh, communicate um, sort of some of our uh, decisions that we were making and reinforce them. And it's uh, looking at feasibility, um, attainability and livability. And what we've found is that it's really easy to dial up your zoning and allow more development potential to make projects feasible from a pro forma standpoint, but oftentimes we see that that's being done and it's actually missing on attainability. And we can talk about that in the Q&A a little bit, but obviously livability is a key part is not just delivering housing for housing sakes, but delivering high quality housing choices. And for us, um, over the last six to seven years in particular, every single one of our public sector projects typically involve a collaboration with an economist uh, where we do what we call the 3D test fits, um, where we'll take uh, a specific range of existing lot sizes from across a city um, and identifying typical lot widths and depths. And then we collaborate with the economist to run the pro forma analysis and feasibility analysis by sub area and also in for rent and for sale um, scenarios. And that really is necessary and a critical part of informing the decisions we make from a policy standpoint, as well as what changes need to be made to zoning in those particular instances. And I just, 
in a big picture, um, when I refer to zoning, I just I, I, I like to send a couple of messages that um, our zoning is a very out of date operating system. This camera on the left was uh, designed and built about the same year that our zoning system was put into place. And I feel pretty strongly that our zoning system has never effectively delivered housing choice. And most of the best examples were built prior to zoning being put in place. But a big part of our zoning message is that every city and county should really be looking at zoning changes as a part of their economic development strategy to deliver housing choice and the type of living that um, uh, people are looking for. And then for us, um, one last tool is visual communication that we feel is really successful. Uh, it, it's it, in terms of how to build support for this broad range of housing choices. And this isn't just about sort of drawing pretty pictures, but actually taking specific opportunity sites and illustrating and demonstrating to community members and decision makers the quality and character of a place that can be delivered um, utilizing a broad range of missing middle housing typologies and then and also understanding the feasibilities of those. So just a few really high level uh, public se se sector examples that we've um, either completed recently or in the process of is the uh, last six to seven years, we've really done a lot of work at the comprehensive plan or general plan level, uh, delivering missing middle housing specific policy mapping and future land use strategies. And what's really great about this is, is our, our examples don't it demonstrate that this isn't just for sort of bigger cities or urban areas like a Memphis or a Cincinnati, but it's also very applicable to rural contexts and small towns. Uh, like the Kauai County um, general plan addressed in that particular comprehensive plan. We've also done more targeted um, zoning and policy changes of what we call a missing middle scan. And we've done this in cities across the country uh, in counties of Greenville, Greensboro, Knoxville, Idaho Falls, um, Athens, Georgia. And the first uh, part of this process is just um, utilizing mapping and data to analyze and prioritize where cities should um, prioritize the application and implementation of missing middle housing. And this often ends up as a supplement um, to a future land use map to inform. And in Greenville, South Carolina, they recently adopted this map next to their future land use map as a, as a priority policy to deliver missing middle housing in these areas. And then we do a deep dive into the zoning and what this often illustrates is how far off a lot of the medium density zoning districts are from actually truly delivering um, missing middle scale development. And this was a, I won't name cities, uh, a medium density zoning district that hypothetically was uh, intended to allow 20 units per acre, um, but on a very typical lot size of 60 feet by 200 feet, simply because the side setbacks for multifamily were 25 feet on each side, which seems completely illogical. It only allowed a 10 foot uh, development strip um, in the middle of the lot, which obviously isn't feasible. And we see these sort of um, sort of barriers all the time from zoning districts that were intended to deliver this, but were just really ineffective. Um, we've also been working on some missing middle plans. Um, this is really exciting. This is uh, some images from the Sacramento citywide missing middle plan. And a really critical piece of this that the city prioritized that we're really excited about is a displacement risk analysis. And then on the right are just some of the, the posters that we established for a robust public engagement a strategy that's part of that plan. Um, and then this is also not just applicable to high value markets, but we're also working with uh, cities like South Bend, Indiana, um, that sort of are struggling and have seen disinvestment over the past four to five decades to, in this particular inst instance in the near Northwest neighborhood that had a lot of vacant lots and disinvestment to study the feasibility of missing middle and to remove the single family zoning to encourage private sector investment. And what's exciting about this is they also adopted a set of pre-approved building plans um, for that uh, for those areas as well as a means of making that more efficient. Uh, we're working regionally um, for the application of missing middle, uh, currently with the Puget Sound region to deliver a missing middle zoning toolkit. Really excited about this. And this was a, a tool to let local jurisdictions get ahead of and be proactive about implementing the the state legislation that actually just got passed this week with HB 1110. 
Uh, we're also really excited to be working with AARP. Um, over the last five years, they've become one of the biggest missing middle advocates. Uh, we recently uh, released this publication with AARP and have been doing workshops, walking tours, and other um, illustrations to communicate to their constituency very broadly. Just a couple of high-level highlights of, of development uh, applications of missing middle. Two of the biggest barriers right now are building code, which triggers commercial building code requirements at three units and construction defect liability. And we can talk about that in the Q&A, but we've been able to work with the developers to deliver um, attainability. And this is a great project called the Muse Homes that we were able to work with a local builder to deliver uh, housing at price points of about $25,000 less per unit than um, their typical tuck under townhouse. Uh, where we worked with this developer um, in the Omaha, Nebraska metro to deliver uh, a, a complete neighborhood of missing middle typologies. And the numbers represent the number of units in each of these buildings. And this is a project in Healdsburg, California, a really great little cottage core that's responding to the demand for smaller living and this desire for the sense of community. And unfortunately, this project took four years to entitle. Uh, typical of California. And so the, the prices of these units got higher than our client wanted. We're also delivering car-free living at a missing middle scale in a project called Cul-de-Sac Tempe um, that's now a couple hundred units um, into construction. And just a, a final concluding thought here is that we see a lot of really well-intended efforts across the country to apply missing middle uh, making some mistakes, and there's a common series of mistakes. So I actually have focused a number of my recent presentations in a current blog post series on the top five mistakes to avoid when applying missing middle. So please uh, take a look at that. And, and with that, I just want to say that um, a quick plug for my book, uh, Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to the Housing Crisis, which you can typically buy from a local bookstore if they have uh, planning and architecture books or is available at Island Press. And with that, I look forward to uh, jumping into the, to the, the further discussion. Great, Dan, thank you so much. That is, uh, was very comprehensive and um, it's raised a number of questions for, for me that I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to diving into. One, one of them I'll just uh, put out there that we haven't really, uh, usually focused on uh, in the missing middle context when you know you're doing legislation uh, to, to enable this type of thing is the financial feasibility of you know the plans that we're uh, producing so um, hopefully we'll we'll get uh, into that some more as we go down the pike here um I next I want to uh, uh, turn it over to um, Ann McAfee from um, uh, city of Vancouver uh, a former planning uh, director there. And uh, I wanna ask you, Anne, to talk about how you got involved in uh, what we're calling missing middle uh, housing. And uh, I know that Vancouver has a very long history and uh, tell us a little bit about that history and also um, how it's actually working um, you know, over, over the years uh, would be great. So Anne, turn, take it away. Thanks, Carol. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Super. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share what's happening north of the border. Uh, we sort of look to what's happening in the south, and I suspect you look north occasionally. And if you've talked about or looked at Vancouver, you may be more familiar with what's happened in the downtown area where over 30 years, Vancouver reconformed, reconfigured the downtown into a livable, we hope, with a few exceptions, walkable community. The question, I started with the city of Vancouver working in the downtown area, looking at how do you actually develop design guidelines for housing people who otherwise um, would be living in the suburbs, particularly families with children, and then started looking at the economics of what services are needed to support the kind of mixed income, mixed household housing. Once that was up and running, my job got shifted to moving me to looking at what was happening in Vancouver's potentially missing middle lands. These are the areas within the city of Vancouver but outside the downtown. 
I was brought up in Vancouver, grew up in the 1950s in one of these neighborhoods. And I actually always thought RS1 meant one sweet permitted, because when I stood on my front uh, steps and looked out at my neighbors, almost every one of those houses had at least one, if not more, what we call secondary suites, or more typically, the public calls mortgage helpers, because it's one way people of more modest incomes at that time could get into the housing market. So on our particular six lots around our home, there are actually 17 homes. It wasn't until I started to work in those neighborhoods that I realized the majority of those units were in fact illegal. And of the 70,000 lots in Vancouver's single family areas, at least half, if not more, have had an illegal suite at some time in their history. Not only have there been suites developed, which have been a good way to get a variety of people of modest means into housing in neighborhoods, there's also, for the last number of years, been laneway homes permitted. These are houses on the back of the property. And since in Vancouver, all of our sites are, have a street and a laneway, is provided an opportunity for people to add some additional accommodation. Since 2005, when laneway homes were permitted as a right, there's been a, over 5,000 of these units built. The question is, who were they for? And in most cases, the laneway homes are being occupied by members of the extended family, a granny, a nanny, and increasingly, as housing is less affordable, adult children. Yes, there are some renters, but we've found that in many cases, the homeowner doesn't want to cope with unrelated renters. If they do, then these are some of the example rents that are now charged plus utilities. Just to give you an idea of what some of the recent development in Vancouver's low density neighborhoods looks like, these three homes, two were built with laneway homes attached to them. And one on the right hand side, a two unit front to back duplex permitted outright in our existing zoning sold um, last month for over $2 million just for the back half of the unit. So these aren't necessarily affordable to many of the service workers and other people who are looking to live in and near their jobs in Vancouver. Some of these units are currently permitted. On the left screen is a typical older single family home, which is permitted as an outright use. Currently in Vancouver's low density neighborhoods, four units such as the middle picture are permitted outright. But if you wish to do a combination of multiple laneway houses and a ex major single family, what used to be single family home, now divided into multiple suites, that would require a rezoning. Concerns about the time and cost involved in those rezonings have meant that currently Vancouver's looking at changing its regulations to allow multiplex homes, four units on a smaller lot, roughly 33 by 120 foot lot, up to six units on a larger lot, typically 60 to 120 um, foot lots. If those are permitted outright, then there has been some analysis done of what the estimated price would be for those new units and what the income required would be to actually purchase one of these multifamily units in those low density neighborhoods. The challenge is that the duplex or fourplex units aren't affordable to many people in Vancouver. 
only 12% of Vancouver households have a household income exceeding $200,000. So units that are coming in, in the 200 and up range, aren't accessible to a large number of people, again, who are looking to live in the city. Our low density single family neighborhoods have for many years, council considered townhouse applications. And from 1975 to 1986, when council was considering rezonings, there was about 40 previously single family zoned sites rezoned for townhouses. Each of those rezonings resulted in significant neighborhood controversy, long public hearings with neighbors doing the typical not in my backyard. We did an interesting study back in 1986, selecting some of those recently rezoned units and looking at what the concerns were that were raised by the neighbors and what actually happened in practice. We looked at the economic impact on adjacent home values. We looked at social impacts and environmental impacts. What we found from the people who were living nearby and who had raised concerns at the public hearing was that most of their concerns did not actually materialize. They were still somewhat concerned about what would happen when they sold their property. But um, generally, they admitted that the concerns around um, overlooking, overshadowing, concerns around increased parking on the streets, increased use of services in the neighborhood hadn't occurred. What we did find was that these units were increasing housing choice and they were particularly attracting area seniors. One of the concerns raised in the NIMBY crowd was that this would bring different people into the neighborhood. In fact, what we found is that many of people who had lived in the neighborhood for years were looking to stay in their familiar neighborhood and the rezonings permitting more townhouses, row houses in the neighborhood offered them the opportunity to stay in their familiar neighborhood um, in a smaller, more accessible unit. Vancouver has for many years also permitted housing above shops in what are otherwise single family or res low density residential neighborhoods. We did a variety of um, studies as to how these were working. And in the 1990s, did some guidelines and requirements to encourage and improve the fit between the apartments and the adjacent homes. But these are typically through the single family neighborhoods. Again, they're attracting people who have lived in the neighborhood or higher income people who would like to live in the neighborhood and close to transit. How do you go about securing support for more housing choice? We found that working with the community and the developers together to come up with plans worked very well. There's a Chinese proverb which says, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me I understand. And with a quite a diverse group of people, engaging with city planners and with the developers, we went to a public hearing for over 1,500 lots to be rezoned all at one time to a mixture of infill, suites, laneway houses, housing above shops, and a major high density development. There were no picket signs at that public hearing. In fact, about 60 people showed up Council approved the rezoning and the community jumped and cheered and clapped council. The message was that people had been involved in setting up the new choices of housing and types of services planned for their neighborhood. Looking back 10 years later, that area has completely redeveloped. As um, an article in the newspaper said, 
the housing choices brought the kids back into the neighborhood. And it was that combination of different forms of housing, including uh, the more traditional missing middle and a variety of apartments, plus community agreed uh, benefits, which brought that support and change to the neighborhood. Which says to me, we're talking about missing middle housing, but really housing is only one component of livability. In order to make the housing work in Vancouver, we found that really we're looking at a combination of Dan, your missing middle housing. We're also looking at the notion of 15 minute neighborhoods. And when you combine the two, we found that adding the housing choices, adding adjacent accessible services leaves only one big uncertainty. And that uncertainty are the funds to implement. Yes, the private sector can clearly fund, but the kind of people who are often looking for this housing simply don't have a living wage or sufficient wages in order to afford some of this new housing that's going in. Plus, the more we move from um, rezonings to outright zoning uses, the less the city is able to garner through um, rezoning fees and applications, meaning that values and charges that the city has to pay to add additional support services like utilities are a question which remains to be answered. So that's what's happened in Vancouver, it's missing middle housing. Thank you, Anne. That uh, was really valuable information. And I think we've already gotten a number of uh, questions in our chat. I do want to get to Jonathan, but I just want to say one thing, which is uh, the term missing middle that we're using, we, we are talking here really about a typology of a, of a home. Um, there are people who use the term missing middle to talk about the income of people, you know, they're not very low income, they're not um, high income. So there, there is a, a missing middle class or a missing um, group of people uh, that can afford uh, homes in general. And I think those terms do get interchangeable uh, uh, inappropriately, but, I, but there is also uh, this question that I think we're gonna wanna dive uh, more into, which is can, a missing middle typology of housing uh, lead to attainable housing without additional um, government subsidy and, uh, uh, you know, or affordable housing with government subsidy and restrictions. So I think that's a conversation that um, maybe Jonathan will touch on, but let's go to Jonathan and then let's come back to that, um, that question. So uh, Jonathan uh, is someone I've known for uh, some period of time uh, and uh, a, a developer of multifamily housing, an investor in multifamily housing, um, very focused on this missing middle, both income and uh, product type in the work he is trying to do in the private sector. Uh, and also uh, extremely engaged in the planning and advocacy uh, conversations in California uh, as a board member of the uh, Casitas Co Coalition. So uh, Jonathan, thank you for uh, being here. I know you're, you're pinch hitting a little bit for <laughs> Denise Pinkston, but uh, I, know you, I know you got it. So uh, take it away. Thanks, Carol. I really appreciate it. And uh, yes, uh, it's great to be a part of this uh, discussion um, and this panel. It's it's certainly near and dear uh, to, to my heart. Um, you know, how, how I got involved in this is, is a little counterintuitive. I, I really actually got interested because of my day job developing um, high density residential projects for the last few decades here in the Bay Area. And there were a couple of things that I just began to realize, you know, kind of number one, um, high density residential is really all that we're building uh, in the Bay Area. Um, and as proud as I am of the projects that I've been a part of and the companies that I've worked for, um, I realize everybody doesn't want to live in a high density uh, in a high density building. Um, but uh, oftentimes people can't afford to live 
um, in a single family home. And so I think that housing diversity uh, is a key piece uh, to keeping people here in the Bay Area and offering uh, housing choice. I also see this as somewhat of an equity issue. Um, the uh, in industry that's delivering high density housing uh, is really dominated by institutional developers uh, that I used to work for uh, and institutional capital, both on the nonprofit and the for profit side. And there's really has been no ability for smaller, less capitalized, and arguably no more diverse uh, developers to participate in our housing delivery system. And I think missing middle housing really, uh, housing forms really can, can address that issue. I also would say that it's in that high density housing, I think we have to understand that it's inherently a costly building uh, product type to produce. Uh, and we really need to encourage and allow um, just a less costly product type. And again, that's where these missing middle housing forms really, I think, start to address that issue. The analogy I like to use with high density uh, buildings is that it's like we're building Teslas uh, and only building Teslas uh, with their you know, uh, fancy technology and gadgetry. Um, and our policy response to only building Teslas is to ask Tesla to either uh, sell or lease a portion of their uh, cars each year to folks that can't afford them, uh, or we're going to subsidize folks uh, uh, to buy or lease Teslas that uh, otherwise can't afford them either. And I think the logical question uh, really is, why don't we build um, you know, Hondas and, and Chevys and, and things of that nature. And so uh, we really need to start looking at, um, you know, instead of efficiencies in terms of modular housing, just built, just offering a less costly um, uh, housing product uh, in the first place. And I think uh, that's why this really uh, speaks to me. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is really, um, you know, uh, the Casita Coalition, when Denise Pinkston came to me, uh, you know, five or six years ago and talked about starting um, you know, a, a group that really advocates solely for small housing forms statewide. It was something that, uh, I, you know, was a no-brainer. Um, and uh, the, for those people who may not know about the Casita Coalition, we're based in California. We are a statewide, multi-sector, nonprofit organization that brings together a diversity of expertise uh, and experience to remove policy barriers uh, around the creation of small homes. And our ultimate vision and goal really is to uh, establish a broad ecosystem that allows small housing to be reduced uh, and flourish, at, you know, at scale. Um, and talking about, you know, going back to Dan's um, uh, presentation, this is a, a graphic I always like to show. This is, uh, and it really illustrates clearly, as shown in pink, how much land we actually dedicate to solely single-family housing. Um, and where only one unit can be built. And to Dan's point, uh, this really reflects values and more even importantly, the population of, of, of 50, 60 years ago. Uh, but we're still living with this uh, today. Um, and where land arguably was not as, uh, uh, was in greater supply uh, back then, it's, it's arguably now, certainly in the Bay Area, uh, one of our most valuable resources, arguably next to water, but one that we use uh, very inefficiently. But it is in this context that we are, uh, through the efforts of the Casita Coalition, seeing what we're calling an accessory dwelling unit or ADU uh, revolution. Uh, revolution. Uh, we are seeing uh, through the laws that have been passed over the last five or six years, uh, ADUs now in every part of the state, uh, urban, rural, wealthy, uh, wealthy communities, low income communities, uh, over 60,000 have been produced uh, or permitted in the last five years. It is a growing industry. Um, it is sizable and growing, which is what we wanted to see. Um, and they're popular. Um, people uh, really, really respond well to ADUs, not only in their own backyards, uh, but in the backyards of their neighbors. And so how did we do it? I mean, we knew we weren't going to be able to get from A to Z just on day one. And so what we did is we started small. We actually had a very modest proposal at the, at the outset uh, that really um, only allowed ADUs in existing structures, uh, did some um, uh, limited uh, parking um, minimums in, uh, in, in ADUs as well and, and eliminated some fees. But once we got the foot in the door, uh, we began to expand and open the door a, a little more incrementally year after year. Uh, it, it does. It, it is of note, though, that even this initial uh, kind of four-way uh, wasn't received necessarily well in Sacramento. Uh, we needed to have a broad coalition uh, around us even to get success on that initial law. But as people saw that the world wasn't, the sky wasn't falling, the world wasn't ending, um, communities weren't being uprooted uh, with these kind of initial um, 
uh, changes, uh, then we were at, gradually able to push the envelope. And in 2019, I think we took a major step forward uh, where the law passed that allowed one accessory dwelling unit and one junior accessory dwelling unit on all lots, um, all single family home lots in, 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 um, in the state of California. That effectively ended single family zoning as we know it in California, although it was underscored in 2021 with SB9, which is a duplex lot split bill, basically allowing now uh, four units uh, on every single family home lot. In addition, uh, we continue to um, work and, and press for laws uh, that, that make uh, uh, ADU deliverance uh, much, much more, much more smooth. Uh, we're hearing from, and this is all informed by our members, uh, so we uh, petitioned the state to allow for uh, objective standards, uh, fee reductions, uh, per, uh, time limits on uh, permit turnaround, uh, things of that nature, just to re uh, remove additional barriers that are standing in the way uh, of really getting um, this type of product type done uh, at scale. What we also did is uh, redefine the debate around local control. Most people think about local control at the city level, uh, but we took it really down to the house level. Um, one of the kind of eye-opening statistics uh, that I like to state is that back in 1970, again, when that um, really uh, a lot of the housing in that map that I showed in, in my first slide was, was created, uh, a nu the nuclear family was 40% of all U.S. households. Uh, today, it's less than 20%. Um, so all that is to say is that uh, the uh, the diversity of U.S. households has increased exponentially uh, over the last few decades, uh, but our zoning really hasn't. It's still that old camera that that Dan uh, has shown. And for diversity of housing of house households, we need a diversity of housing types, and we believe that is best done and best determined by the folks living uh, on those individual parcels. It shouldn't be determined by your neighbors. It shouldn't be determined by government to to, to say who and what a family unit is. That really should be uh, the folks that actually uh, live on that on that on that piece of property. Um, and uh, coalition building is is absolutely fundamentally key. Was key from the outset, and as we continue to, uh, as I mentioned, push the door open further, uh, we are going to and we have stirred up opposition. And uh, the strategy we use to counter that uh, is to really look and seek out uh, like-minded uh, groups. Uh, that really see the importance and the benefit of missing middle housing and particularly accessory dwelling units uh, from environmentalists to teachers uh, to social justice advocates and, and obviously legislators them, legislators themselves. Uh, but as, as one can imagine, as you do begin to lift barriers, uh, you know, that makes people nervous. And so you need to have the chorus get bigger and bigger and singing louder and louder uh, to counteract um, the voices that people are going to be hearing that uh, are going to be resistant uh, of, of those changes. And what we're very excited about and what we're also seeing is that there has just been a huge expansion um, uh, of folks uh, and groups uh, within the ADU field. Um, and there's, there is investment that's piling in, but most importantly, there's just smart minds that are, that are getting engaged in this topic that um, is really the most one of the most bedeviling issues that we're certainly we're seeing in the state of California, but uh, I'd argue in other areas of the country as well. And it's all based on the fact that now we have an ecosystem um, because of those state laws that can allow for uh, folks to really thrive in this environment. And we know that zoning is, and I think Dan would would, would agree with this, and, and Anne as well, is that zoning is kind of the first step that needs to happen. It's probably the most important. Uh, but it's not the only one. The skies don't open up uh, when the zoning gets changed. There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to see that this type of product type actually begins to thrive. And there's a lot of barriers. And so that's the other thing that, that the CETA Coalition does. It mentioned some of those, um, uh, those, those removal efforts that we've done in terms of reducing permit timelines and reducing fees and things of that nature. Um, but it's just the first step. And there's a lot of secondary and tertiary issues that need to be dealt with um, that we continue to work on. And I'll 
stop there um, and turn it back over to uh, the conversation and, and, and discussion, but just want to give a quick plug. Uh, if folks want to understand about the Casita Coalition and better yet, you know, join the Casita Coalition, please go do visit our website at casitacoalition.org. We are in the process of organizing our first national convening uh, later on this year. We'd love to see folks, obviously, from this webinar there uh, to be a part, uh, but really excited to be part of this discussion. And um, yeah, Carol, um, happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, in the in the chat here that uh, I want to get to. And I want to start with uh, the question uh, that's come up around um, affordability. And I've, I've heard two things from all, all three of you, which is um, this is not a panacea. Uh, missing middle is not a panacea to um, extremely low income households uh, you know, uh, having affordability restrictions on uh, these these homes uh, for a variety of reasons. One, you know, if you've got a homeowner uh, on on the lot, um, are they going to want to uh, have an accessory dwelling unit or, an, or a rental unit um, on their lot uh, that is um, rented, let alone um, uh, restricted uh, to certain uh, incomes? Uh, and and I guess the question is uh, for each of you, and I'm going to start with you, Anne, because I think Vancouver has the most you know long-term experience with this. Um, how does that play out relative to the policy conversations uh, and the zoning conversations uh, to you know continue to enable this type of housing? Like, is it is it becoming a barrier? Uh, that we're not reaching down to extremely low income, or even in some cases, what Dan calls, you know, attainable um, housing, um, is it going to stop the movement because it's not getting to those that that level, or or like how are how are each of you really thinking about that affordability uh, question? So, Anne, I'm going to start with you. But two perspectives on that. One is that because we've had a very long history in Vancouver of these mortgage helpers, secondary suites, and in some cases more than one in a what looks like a single family home from the street, we found that those units have tended to house um, sort of modest income people, students in areas near the university uh, until prices went up there. And in many cases, families who um, single parents who are otherwise unable to find appropriate accommodation in a high-rise apartment. So it's certainly been working well in terms of having a range of incomes accommodated when you're on an individual lot and a homeowner is using it as a mortgage helper. The new units that are coming, and secondly, we've got um, a number of instances where some of the small infill townhouses were developed with federal and provincial funding for nonprofits and co-ops and co-housing. And those ones are meeting a, quite a good range of incomes. For the newer units, some of the examples I showed, if you're going to purchase, the price of purchase is much beyond the sort of service worker in the community. We're not looking here at um, housing people who are currently homeless. That was never sort of the thought. And most homeowners wouldn't necessarily want to take on the responsibility of not only the housing, but the support services that are required. So we're normally looking in these units at people who um, are maybe willing to rent, but the rents are such that it's, it's pushing the boundaries for people who are uh, modest income service workers in the city. And it's certainly too expensive for many of those workers to consider purchasing some of these new infill units. Thank you. So, so you're basically saying the, the, the only option is you're creating more housing, but the option is uh, really you, you need to have some additional subsidy if you want to reach down to the you know, low, lower income levels. Um, and, in, and in many cases, what we see is the bank of mom and dad 
covering the costs for younger people to purchase. Right. Thank you. Dan, do you and, have a and I was going to say the bank of mom and dad has the resources in many cases of the single family home that they own. So as those prices have gone up or values have gone up, the parents are able to borrow. If you come from outside Vancouver, you don't have that option. Thank you. You know, you know yeah. what's, what's really interesting is at some point, somehow four units per lot became this magic number that everybody thought was going to solve the solution. But what SB9 is demonstrating and what we've done in other parts of the country, especially in higher value markets, is you're going to need more than four units on a lot for it to pencil out and for it to encourage the delivery of these choices. But the other thing we see like related to capping a number of units is if you calculate your building envelope and it allows 10,000 square feet of development potential, but you're capping it at four units. So you're getting four 2,500 square foot units. Like that's what a developer is going to build. And they're going to be a million and a half plus. And that we see that in a lot of markets as well. So why not within that same 10,000 square foot building envelope allow for 10, you know, eight units, 10 units to get to more attainable rents or purchase prices. And, and, we're doing a, a couple, we're doing a really interesting project in Santa Maria, California, where the city removed their density cap and still cap, but they cap the height at three stories and it's on an 80 foot, 90 foot lot. And our client is having us deliver micro units, 350, 400 square feet. And so we're delivering 130 dwelling units per acre in a two and three story building. And that's delivering attainably priced housing for you know, single person households or young couples or maybe two people, but not for families. But that's one way sort of removing that density cap within a defined form can do it. And then in Seattle, uh, the city allows the ADU to be sold separate from the primary unit. So we're working on a project with the developer there where, you know, the ADUs are capped at a thousand square feet. So this is a really creative way to deliver smaller, more attainably priced houses to a market. It's super, super interesting. Um, that, that's great. I think that's a great distinction of, you know, part of the way you get to affordability is a smaller, um, a smaller home. And I think that was originally the intent anyway, uh, maybe not the way the zoning, but, you know, an SB9 was written, but, you know, that was the intent is that you, if you have smaller, you have more homes on a lot, they're going to be smaller homes. Therefore, the net, the price is naturally going to be uh, less, and we're not we're not really seeing that play out. Depending on how these um, zoning restrictions are implemented, Jonathan, I see you nodding your head. Do you have anything to add to this that this part of the conversation on affordability? Yeah, I mean, I I think you know Dan was kind of hitting on something. Um, you know, I think we have to look at this two different ways. You know, one is, you know, certainly from an ADU perspective, I mean, you know, homeowners aren't developers. I think we have to keep that in mind. They're looking at this kind of proposition in a totally different way. Um, you know, it's it's, it's likely the, it, they're, they're very ex expensive. Um, so it's going to be one of the things that, you know, homeowners themselves, it's a, it's a big lift for a homeowner to build an ADU oftentimes. And so, you know, for us, it's like, you know, we want to make that as easy as possible, even if there's rumors that, you know, they're going to be somehow limited in, you know, their ability to, uh, you know, rent or utilize an ADU. I think most people will say it's not worth the expense to do it. And so that's where we get a little concerned about, you know, restrictions on you know, the future use of ADUs. I, I think there's also a lot of surveys that are now coming out that basically say that, you know, homeowners aren't acting like professional property managers either, and that, you know, ADU rents are, you know, oftentimes less than comparable market rents because they just, they don't, they don't price their units in the, in the same kind of way. Um, what I'll also say about SB9, I think one of the issues, uh, and this is something that we fought hard about it with ADUs, is, is the owner occupancy requirement. I think that is a big reason why, you're not seeing a lot of, of of action happening under SB9s because it's it's a it's a big lift to do an ADU. It's a, it's it's a development project to do two duplexes on a lot that you own, um, and so I think you know um, until that is lifted and you're it, it, it's going to still be limited in its effect because really that kind of product type as as Dan is mentioning really is the, the, the is is the is the realm of a small developer to do. It's not really 
feasible for an individual homeowner to do that kind of project. So I think that's something to keep in mind too. It's again, you pass a law, but there are other issues that come behind that 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 stunt the the, the effectiveness. Great, thank you. Um, let, let's go on to a couple other questions that uh, again. Uh, uh, I'm seeing in, in the chat and uh, Dan, your comment about going to say 130, you know, small uh, units really, uh, I think, puts a shine, uh, a light on this, which is more pushback uh, just because it is more units. Um, yes, it's maybe more attainable from an affordability perspective, but, um, you know, parking, infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, Anne mentioned earlier, just, you know, the municipal cost of services uh, with, with more people. So uh, does that become, you know, a limiting barrier at, at some point? So Dan, I'll go to you and then if other people want to comment. Well, I think it's going to be a, an added challenge from a community buy-in standpoint, for sure, unfortunately, <laughs> um, because people will always sort of Parking will be the biggest issue. Traffic will be the next issue. But it's, uh, I think, um, you know, part of my message is we need to get beyond worrying about perceived problems, potential future problems, and actually address our housing problem, um, right? And it's just needing to build the political support. Um, you know, in the case of this Santa Maria infill project, as they had, the city had completed a specific plan that went through all the hoops of the environmental impact report um, and the infrastructure assessment. Um, so they they sort of got ahead of that. Um, and kudos to the city of Santa Maria for, you know, taking the density cap out of their zoning. Like, I think that's a really great way. And it's, it's I think they're seeing some really interesting results um, as a part of that. But it's, I think you'll continue, you'll get, you'll get the pushback, but I think, you know, I think I think local decision makers just need to to sort of be able to sort of support these types of creative solutions to get us to that new operating system, 21st century operating system in our zoning. Um, so it's it's unfortunately never as easy as it should be. But I think as the housing crisis gets worse and worse everywhere, that uh, there's enough support for it. Thank you. Uh, you know, a uh, question, Jonathan, uh, that you raised uh, or raised when I saw your slide that, you know, uh, I think the top barrier uh, to all of this was um, financing. Can you talk a little bit more about what uh, Casitas Coalition is trying to uh, advocate for or do, you know, either in the private sector or with government to to deal with that financial issue? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's it's the biggest issue, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I think what we are are really trying to do is advocate you know, up on the federal level um, to to really, um, you know, update their lending standards and and recognize ADUs as, you know, uh, something that's valid. And, and we're seeing some some movement in that uh, recently. Um, there's a, some legislation that's that's happening now around the 203K loan. Um, that recognizes um, the income from an ADU uh, to be uh, used uh, for qualification for that kind of loan. So uh, it really, uh, you know, I think the federal government really has a, a large role to play here. Um, and that's, we, we certainly uh, advocate for that as well. And to Dan's point about um, uh, what happened in Seattle around, uh, you know, uh, allowing ADUs to be um, condoized, uh, for lack of a better term, that is a bill that we are pushing uh, in the state of California right now um, to allow that, to allow greater flexibility um, around how how an ADU can get developed and create uh, uh, wealth for, the, for for a homeowner. So in those couple of ways. Okay. Uh, the, those who uh, are unfamiliar, 203K is the Federal Housing Administration, a really uh, rehab loan. So trying to expand uh, the ability for a homeowner to get, quote, a rehab loan to um, actually, you know, build out a, a secondary uh, unit uh, is what Jonathan was talking about. Carol, can we talk a little bit about parking? Sure. Um, this addiction we have to parking requirements in our country and the need to really rethink that to fully enable 
sort of attainable housing choices. And um, it sort of you sparked that in my head and then Jonathan's comment, because I, from what I understand and what I've seen in my neighborhood is California's ADU ordinance, sort of it's been through several, right, refinements and iterations when it became really effective is when they removed the parking requirement when they said you can't, the local jurisdictions can't require an off-street parking space. And then all of a sudden on these small lots, the ADU started popping up because people are okay parking on the street, <laughs> you know? Um, and the, the missing middle neighborhood I showed in Nebraska is, I love it for a lot of reasons, but it's in a suburban context. There's no transit at all we're assuming everybody's going to get in their car and either drive if they have to go to work drive to work but it's parked at one off street parking space per unit with one space with sorry with other spaces being provided on street and it's now outperforming every other multifamily project in the region and people were like oh people aren't going to park on the street they they, they need a garage space it, it snows in nebraska and I think these projects are just all systematically chipping away at all these myths about uh, parking and what's going to happen if we don't provide a bunch of off-street parking and, and the, the Santa Maria model wouldn't be possible. It's like, I think, 0.5 spaces per unit off-street, maybe even less than that. And that's what makes that possible. But there's a ton of on-street parking in that whole neighborhood. Vancouver is lucky because we have quite good um, public transit, lots of bike lanes, even though it rains here, not sunny like in California, we yeah. still have a lot of people um, pushing along on their bikes. So the requirements for parking on site have been remarkably reduced, not only for things like um, laneway houses, which require no parking, but also for a lot of apartments now, the reduction in parking is adding um, more uh, opportunities to reduce the cost of housing. That said, a lot of people are parking on the streets. And interestingly, communities who used to complain about parking on the streets now find that's a great way of reducing speed for through traffic on streets. So many of the neighborhoods are seemingly reasonably happy with the parking uh, being on the street because it's a traffic calming device. And one thing I'll add to this, I think that needs to be said is that I think people need to be kind of, people need to understand the benefits of, of density as well. And I think the other part of zoning that people may not realize is, is, is the other things that aren't allowed um, that start to make sense when you add, add density to a neighborhood. So, you know, oftentimes people now have to get into their car to go to a coffee shop. Well, you know, that actually may be something that if you change zoning to allow that kind of stuff, you actually walk to those things instead of having to get into a car. And they, and, and cities need to start allowing, I think, some of those uses in, in residential neighborhoods where they're now prohibited. So there's another kind of layer around zoning that also needs to kind of be studied uh, to make the, you know, parking reductions not seem as scary as, as, as what people kind of envision them to be and, and beneficial. And yeah. for me, that's why you sort of combine um, missing middle with the um, 15 minute or the 10 minute walkable yeah. city, because as you get that mix, it allows you to be more creative in terms of what's required. I noticed in the chat, one of the questions about how is the city addressing when the children came back school problems. That's not really an issue we've had in Vancouver. Not primarily because most of these neighborhoods where the missing middle has going in are neighborhoods which were built during the 1950s with the post-war baby boom. And so effectively, as the schools were put in for those initial homes and families, there's then been a removal of many of the children from the neighborhoods, meaning some of the schools are closing or in threat of closing. So the new missing middle housing is actually keeping some of the schools and services open. That said, some of our infrastructure is aging, needs upgrading, and as you speed the process of some of these developments, you do it by not requiring rezoning, but at the same time, that means the ability of cities to get additional revenue to support some of the city 
um, services and infrastructure uh, diminishes. So if there is a need for anything, it's actually a need for looking at, in Canada, how municipalities are funded, the very limited sources of revenue, and the requirement to balance the budget, all of which makes it very difficult to provide the range of services with so much downloading going on to municipalities picking up responsibilities that used to be senior government responsibilities. Yeah, and 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 I will just say, and I want to go on to some other questions. I will just say, in California, the it's you know we have the, op the opposite problem, but a different problem, which is uh, it doesn't matter what the zoning is, uh, you still charge on a per unit basis uh, all kinds of fees, you know, to be sure that you can upgrade the infrastructure or have the um, you know school fee to build you know a school eventually. All, all of these fees. And then that becomes, okay, now that's the burden of the individual uh, owner of that uh, house because it gets passed on in the in the price. It's one of the things that increases the cost. So it's back to, you know, there was a time, at least in the United States and sounds like in Canada, where the government provided infrastructure for housing. Like this was part of the, you know, part of the system. And uh, that, that, you know, maybe we need to figure out how to get back to that. But I think that's a little beyond the um, this particular panel. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that one for the next one. I want to go to a question I see here in the chat, which um, came up in my mind as I was hearing, uh, Dan, you speak about a number of the uh, places like uh, South Bend or Nebraska. Uh, and these uh, tend to be I think larger scale uh, developments where there's an actual developer, you know, building out uh, this, these typologies, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, versus I think, you know, the accessory dwelling unit and, you know, at least in California, and it sounds like maybe in Vancouver, I'm not sure. Uh, we're, we're really talking more about smaller lots, you know, homeowner owning a lot. Can, can, all of you talk about, I'll start with you, Dan, but you know, the, you know, the difficulty of scaling um, these individual lots and are there barriers that we need to figure out how to overcome to uh, enable you know, all these small lots and you know, maybe ones owned by homeowners or um, you know, very small parking lots or things like that, because you know, that, I think that's gonna be necessary for this uh, kind of, plan uh, to scale. So Dan, why don't we start with you and then uh, Jonathan and Anne if yeah. you have something to add. Yeah, this is a this is a great subtopic. I think the the South Bend example um, would definitely be delivered on a lot by lot basis by a smaller local builder. It's just the it's just that 60% of the lots are vacant because the of teardowns um, over the course of 50 years, but it's more most likely going to be built by a smaller local builder. Um, and what I'd say is the Nebraska example is a, a bigger multifamily project on a larger site. And it's interesting when, when I created this concept now 11 years ago, I thought we'd be only focused on like small scale individual lot infill. And we still do a lot of that. And we still enable a lot of that with our planning and zoning. But what we realized is that there's a need for this to be delivered at the big scale in the bigger projects at the 10 plus acre scale. So we sort of shifted some of our attention to reestablishing models or establishing new models for the delivery of missing middle at scale because we wanted to maximize our impact of sort of missing middle thought leadership. Um, and I, I think that um, uh, to Jonathan's point earlier is, right, it's, it's, it's going to be the small local builders mostly on these individual lots. And that's a challenge to sort of build that ecosystem. And we put so many barriers in place that that ecosystem disappeared, whether it be the builder or the bank that's gonna finance this. And, um, but what's really exciting is to see a lot of the, I mean, even like the Turner Center's um, uh, efforts to fund these incubation, incubate these small businesses. I forgot the name of your program, Carol, but I see- The housing lab. The housing lab, I see innovation happening in those small businesses to like try to figure out how to give the homeowners like the tools or how to establish a small business that can actually help homeowners or just coming at it from a number of different ways. So I think it's really 
just giving that ecosystem the opportunity to rebuild itself um, and support it like the, the housing lab is doing. And um, it's exciting to see that. Great. Jonathan, do you have, can you comment on the kind of California experience here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, to Dan's point, um, you can see the juxtaposition in the success that we're having around ADUs and the limited success we're having around SB9. And it's kind of for the things that I, that I kind of pointed out is that, you know, we need to um, build an ecosystem. And, you know, we, we, we have to understand that we don't have that, eco that ecosystem in place right now. It has, it has basically been zoned out over the last 50 years. And so to, uh, to establish the ground rules and the depth of the, of the pool in essence, you know, that will allow somebody to actually start and maintain and sustain a business, you really have to have this broad scale change. And, you know, that's why I think that with all of the concern around owner occupancy, I understand why it exists, but I just don't think from a development standpoint um, that, you know, certainly none of the large companies that I've ever worked for will ever do this kind of one-off building uh, because you just, can't, you can't get the, you can't get the economies to do that. So I do think this will remain and be the opportunity for, for small scale builders. Um, and what I believe is that those small scale builders will, can better represent the communities that they're in. They'll be less contentious. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, benefits that can go along with this, but I think you really have to clear those ground rules. Um, and I, it, the, the, the proof of the pudding is there for ADUs. I mean, it's just as one off as all as, as the other stuff, but you're seeing a bunch of people pile in a bunch of, a bunch of organizations pile in because the, the opportunity is there. The, and the, the field has been set and, and freed. We need to do that on a on a. The next step is to is to do it on a on a small scale housing basis. But yeah, I think then you also you've got these so many smaller scale companies. I saw on on, on the logo lists, you know, of of uh, casinos members uh, doing you know infill through modular or kit building, you know, other innovative ways to get um, uh, to get to scale, uh, you know. Than, than just you know building on site uh, construction. So you know I think that that that's helpful. Uh, uh, real quickly, and do you have anything to add to, to this about how you know how it's working in uh, Vancouver? Because I want to go to kind of the opposite um, <laughs> opposite question, which is why can't we go bigger with this strategy? Uh, so go ahead, Ann. Uh, in Vancouver, there's really several building industries the people who are building these infill and conversion units tend to be small scale builders who specialize in that. And the larger builders are busy doing the um, high rise apartment buildings, different markets, but dealing with some of the same issues around um, who's going to purchase the affordability and supply chain issues of getting uh, product delivered to the sites but it's primarily small scale builders who are focusing on these, as you call them, ADUs, we call them laneway houses. Great, we have a question here um, that I think takes us almost to the opposite end of the spectrum here, which is, um, the, the question is ask, ask the panelists about the relationship between affordability, employment security, proximity and land ownership and think of you know, industrial projects in Bourneville in the UK 200 years ago. Think about, you know, AARP, for example, uh, you know, supporting essentially, te you know, a, a campus of uh, this type of variety of uh, missing middle housing. And like, why, what's stopping us from doing that? Or what is stopping, you know, the large scale landowners or, or developers from doing that? Anybody have a thought there? Well, can I just say what we've seen with our developer clients is a, a lack of risk tolerance, um, or if they're publicly traded, right? Uh, just that accountability to their board. Um, and but so like our one of our most innovative projects, which is the cul-de-sac Tempe project, it was actually it's being developed by uh, the founders. The two founders of cul-de-sac are actually two of the smartest people I've ever worked with, Ryan Johnson and Jeff Behrens, but they're coming at this from a 
a, a slightly different perspective. And so they're, they don't, they don't, they're not developers, actually. There is like prop tech influencing change. And I feel like we're seeing a lot of sort of the biggest changes and innovations happening from the sort of prop, prop tech influence side of the development scenario of like, they were the only ones willing to kind of stick their necks out and say, we believe car free is viable. Um, and they found the, the capital to support that idea. And now they're, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the first phase of residents move in this next month. And uh, I think they have 11,000 people on a waiting list for what will be 600 units. And so I think it's going to prove the viability, but I think part of it's nobody wants to be first, <laughs> right? Everybody's happy to be the second. Um, but I think the level of innovation that's happening is not nearly enough. And, and I just, I don't see, and I'd love to hear uh, Jonathan's perspective from the development side is like, there's so very little R&D happening um, with, within the development sector. It's just sort of like, it's like the efficiencies are there and it's like, we're, we're so many units behind, we need to keep going. So it's, it's kind of an interesting um, dilemma of sorts. Yeah, you know, um, guilty as charge. You know, I think that um, it is a challenge. I mean, you know, as somebody that's worked for a development firm, uh, you know, I I, I, don't, I say that I'm not a developer. I've, I've worked for a development firm. And, and you know, the, the issue there is that, you know, these, certainly in the Bay Area, I mean, these projects range in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, and they take years, right? I mean, they take five to seven years. And so it is very difficult to innovate. I mean, I, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, you, you really are uh, focused on just trying to get something across the finish line. And, uh, you know, we have, Graystar, the company I work for uh, prior to my current firm, we have a whole innovation division um, that was focused on, you know, product types and things of that nature, but to stick to, 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 to put forth something to, to change what has worked in the past is a very challenging thing to do. And you better be right. Uh, because if you're not, um, you know, that, you know, you, you know, like I said, uh, in government, nobody gets fired for, for saying no, you know, uh, but people do get fired for saying yes. And so I, I think it's just, it's just one of those things. It's just the, it's certainly in the, in the Bay area, there's the inherently long process, long um, time for time frame about how long it takes an individual project to get built. It's very difficult to innovate. Um, I, I think you can see it in other areas of the country, however, where you can you can spin projects um, quicker. And I think some of the areas that you that you deal with, Dan, I think are are, are right for that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, just the dollars that are that are uh, at stake, it doesn't encourage it. A lot of developers are like, I, I don't want to be the first. I'll I'll, I'll I'll be the second adopter, not the first. Let somebody else take that take that risk and see what the bugs are, and then we'll go for it. And because of the, the money that's at stake. And the ability to, to track capital, because oftentimes capital is just as, uh, if not more, um, yeah. actually uh, conservative than uh, than the developer itself. Um, and so you actually have to convince somebody else to invest in that. Um, and uh, they, you know, certainly have a lot of questions about where it's been done before, how successful it has, has been. We we had a a micro unit project that we had a hard time uh, getting capitalized because of that the, that those those very questions that they hadn't seen it proven out. And so it's very challenging. And sorry, Jonathan, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but um, uh, but part of this is like there's a reason most of our more innovative developer driven projects are not in California. Yeah. If it took if it took four years to entitle eight cottages, right. you know, like imagine the risk of the 300 unit, 400 plus unit project. Yeah, it's it's there's a reason the innovation's happening elsewhere. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's right. Unfortunately, yeah. And I would say, you know, there, there are uh, steps that, that I see major home builders taking, you know, so uh, sell, designing and selling a single family home, but having approved plans for an added unit, um, you know, in the back um, that the homeowner can then um, get done, you know, no zoning um, and, uh, you know, it's already designed and, and they can implement it uh, if and when they, you know, have the funds to, to do that. So I, I do think there are some maybe baby steps uh, that are that are happening there. Um, you know, construction defect liability prevents those same developers from wanting to stack units, right, as well, which is a huge barrier that I'm hoping somebody will tackle soon. Um, 
uh, because it's we're at a point in our markets where we need stacked units for sale. And especially in missing middle scale buildings, it's just not going to happen unless that liability and that risk goes away. So we're also seeing quite a number of examples where lock off suites are being built as part of a unit, particularly in uh, small in apartment buildings where the design will be such that a person can purchase a whole what would be a largest unit, but they can rent part of it. It has a separate entrance from the corridor to help them pay for the unit. And then as their family grows or maybe a relative wants to move in, they can open it, that lock off unit and bring it back into the uh, main unit. So these lock off units are one example of how that flexibility is being built in. But I'm not sure to Mark's question, how many people who are um, major employers actually have the resources to purchase and compete in the market for some of these few remaining, certainly in Vancouver, few remaining larger sites. Um, I'd be certainly looking at the question of what I was paying my employees rather than trying to build the housing for the employees given the lack of sites and the time it takes to uh, deliver the product. I know we're, we're uh, you know, down to our last 10 minutes here, but um, I do want to ask uh, each of you to talk about, you know, you mentioned construction defect uh, uh, liability issues, Dan, but the whole idea of renting, you know, a, a, a part of your home or you know the back you know the back of your lot uh, I think there's a, a place for that that's going to continue but it also just seems to me that at least in the United States um, uh, or at least in you know kind of the western expensive markets we're not seeing um, the individual ownership that we were talking about that could be more attainable price point uh, because the home is smaller and structure defect liability might be one of those, one of the barriers, but it seems to me that just financing uh, that structure uh, is, you know, also challenging. So just wondering whether uh, all of you could talk about, and I'm going to start with Anne, because I think maybe Canada has a, a different, uh, <laughs> different abilities uh, here or a different take on things like how, how, do um, you know how does individual home ownership, you know, or condominiums get financed in Canada? And can can we think about how that applies to uh, other other parts of the country? So, what changes uh, we would need to make in other countries to uh, help that happen? And I'm thinking about your comment about cooperatives or um, other kinds of ownership structures. Certainly the um, use over many years of federal and provincial funds for cooperative housing and now co-housing uh, nonprofit developments has meant that for finding the funding, it is available, but a very limited scale. More of the funding that's going out at the moment in Canada to promote increasing housing supply is going to larger developers who are getting lower interest um, money for the construction, for the mortgages, covering that. And having just looked at what's being built with all of those funds that are trying to encourage new supply, very few of the units are affordable to somebody who we would say was in core housing need or in the sort of lower service jobs. So the federal government has had some involvement in trying to increase supply through making funding available. Uh, Co-op and nonprofit has been working quite well, just very few funds are available. Lots of buildings happening in the rental market, but very little in the ownership market through the government at the moment. Are you familiar with uh, the California dream for all um, and you know, 
how the state of California or Dan and how the state of California is using essentially down payment assistance funds and uh, to help home ownership in, in general. And could that be applied um, maybe with some changes in some way to you know, the actual division of lots and construction of um, new homes? I'm not super familiar with that, but I think anything we can do to, I think we need to be thinking about ownership, not that everybody needs to own, but it's just a way to obviously build um, health household wealth. And um, I think thinking about it through an equitable lens as well is super important um, uh, and getting, you know, historically sort of uh, disadvantaged or black, the black and brown households that we made it impossible for them to buy <laughs> homes uh, with federal and local policy. So, but I, I think anything we can do, any tools we can put in place to figure out help, help with ownership, I think the better. Um, it's not, not my area of expertise. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I know that it was completely oversubscribed, uh, obviously, the first go round. And, um, you know, uh, and, and to Dan's point, yeah, anything I think that can aid home ownership, I, I do feel like it does come back to we've got to find some way to allow for, you know, more production of 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 affordable types of housing to be created. And I think, you know, Dan's point about the the condo liability, it's more than that. I mean, I think it's, it, I guess the condo liability issue has such ripple effects in terms of effect that really do affect the cost of delivering condominiums because uh, there are contractors and, and architects that just won't touch it. Uh, they won't, they won't even, so the, the pool of folks that you have to go to is smaller. So they obviously uh, can raise costs there. Uh, the insurance that you have to get uh, just raises the, the 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 cost of the product type. And so being able to address that situation, I think, um, is kind of these unseen costs that people don't really understand. Um, and then not even to go into some of the building uh, code issues that 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 sprout up. Um, all these things need to be addressed to really lower the cost. And, and what I also am not sure um, how much it still plays in, but I think it does. It's just the hangover from the last decade, the before the Great Recession, and that capital isn't there um, around condos. They, they got burned bad, badly. Um, in, you know, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, around ownership housing, and uh, you really have not seen uh, that come back in any meaningful way. Um, and I don't know what addresses that, but certainly uh, the liability factor uh, is is a is a huge issue. But I, I do think that is a critical key step in delivering the kind of housing that people want to see that Dan is illustrating there, um, rather than like, you know, townhomes. I think, uh, you know, I point to uh, to Houston, what is what they are doing is building a ton of townhomes. It is keeping down their housing costs, uh, but they're building townhomes because of this liability issue. Uh, and they want this vertically separated um, uh, uh, housing stock. And I, I don't think it's the most efficient way to, to develop lots, but um, it, it is it's a it's a conundrum yeah thank you thank you jonathan and um we've just gone through a whole bunch of barriers here and uh we have two minutes left and i just would like to do a um or that was pretty depressing jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> so can we just do a quick lightning round like what makes you optimistic you know that this movement, which, you know, is having a moment. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt it's having a moment right now. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dan, let me start with you and then we'll go back or, around quickly, just, you know, 30 seconds on why are you optimistic? Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's super exciting to me is to see that this missing middle has really become a movement at this point. And there's even like nonprofit community organizations that are using this to try to build support for this these much needed housing choices. And I'm I'm excited to see at the sort of in the public sector that we're now working at this regional scale to remove the barriers and provide shared systems of zoning and planning and policy to sort of enable this more broadly in a in a similar way that I guess the state legislation is doing, but it's keeping uh, more of the control and the local jurisdictions are able to be more proactive to try to get ahead of it. Um, and then, you know, we are seeing we're continuing to see developers knock at our door and they want to innovate um, and uh, 
you know, in markets across the country. And so, you know, whether it's a car-free project like a cul-de-sac or a missing middle neighborhood in Omaha, Nebraska, there's still, you know, it's, it, there's still, there's innovation happening. It's just the seeds are being planted that will, that will grow and, and ultimately have an impact in established models. Great. And 30 seconds. It's much more expensive to try and build suburban sprawl housing than infill. And so what I'm excited about with the um, increasing infill is the opportunity to use some of the existing services, make more efficient, effective use of our land and not sprawl into agricultural land, forestry lands, or into the extra costs of expanding all the infrastructure. And to say nothing about, you know, the impact on um, the climate. So um, another reason to be optimistic about needing to do more infill. Jonathan, last word. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I've been doing this for 20 years and the, just the the politics around housing and housing production have just completely changed. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, you would be lucky to get anybody to show up for your project to support it uh, that wasn't, you know, somehow involved. And now um, with, you know, the movements that are happening, that that is completely changed. People really understand the importance of housing for to what you said, Carol, from a climate standpoint. Uh, we have a huge generation um, of, of young folks that are wanting to buy housing and wanting to live in communities that are seeing that they can't. And that's where we are. We're at an inflection point and uh, it's going to be change and change is never comfortable, never easy. But I definitely see that the winds are going in the in the right direction. It always makes me hopeful. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank our panelists very much for uh, engaging in the conversation and uh, LAI for hosting uh, this housing affordability uh, series. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.